MBA at American University in We very much appreciate the hat. Thank you very much. You might find the flag here at American University. His MIS in 2001 in the field of peace and conflict resolution, and as a true change maker and continued learner, he's pursuing his doctorate in peace studies at the University of Bradford in the United Kingdom. Here at AU, he is well remembered um, by his professors that taught him, and we actually have two of them with us today, including Dean Lou Goodman, also um, taught the president, and so we're thrilled, uh, and he is well remembered here. Today, he will be engaging in conversation with SIS Pre Professor Susan Scheffler, who is right here, who has two decades of experience working in West Africa, where she produced scholarship that helped to inform international interventions of many kinds. Professor Scheffler leads the PhD program here at SIS and all, is also affiliated as a visiting lecturer at the University of Makini in Sierra Leone. President Bio, we are so glad to welcome you back and to hear your perspective of leading on the global stage. Welcome back. President Sylvia Bowen, Provost, staff and students of the great American University, Sorry. distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is unfair to be here today because I'm so excited that I can hardly make sense of what I'm going to say. <laughs> 20 years ago, I was here as a student, a mature student, and today I'm here as the president of the Republic of Syria. As far as goes out to look for world leaders, today they have their own world leader. <laughs> So I'll start by thanking you, and uh, Mr. Madam President, and members of the board and faculty of the School of International Service for putting together this great lecture. I would also like to thank each and every one of you who has come today to be part of this engagement. Your presence here is testament to your commitment to international affairs, your dreams, and the incredible potential each of you hold. It is a riveting opportunity to address such a diverse and dynamic group of people from different backgrounds, fields, and persuasions. Standing before you in this hallowed wars, we have taught leaders of past, present, and future Converge, I am acutely aware of the transformative journey of learning that unfolds within these walls. I am a testament to that. This institution symbolizes the relentless pursuit of knowledge, the endeavor to refine perspectives, and the audacity to challenge and enrich worldviews we hold. When we step into an institution like this, we pledge to view the world through refreshed and curious eyes. To welcome opposing views, not as threats, but as gateways to understanding. Indeed, I'm sure that everyone here, but especially from the School of International Service, who agree that there is no greater honor than dedicating oneself 
to the service of humanity. As I stand before this August gathering, I'm transported to a time of rigorous intellectual pursuits and fervent aspirations that marked my years at this esteemed institution in 1997, from 1997 to 2002. I cannot, I cannot overstate the American University's impact on my post-military leadership journey. Thank you, AU. <laughs> Reconnecting with fellow alums and re revisiting the rich academic tenets and principles that served as the bedrock of my education, I'm reminded of the priceless value of an education that, is, that seamlessly blends knowledge with pragmatism. I learn here the intrinsic worth of being prepared to serve the global community, not just as a leader, but as a harbinger of peace, a bridge builder fostering understanding amidst the mirrored complexities of our contemporary world. Reflecting upon my recent journey through the winding trails, trails of Sierra Leone's election landscape, the profundity of human capital is clear to me. Amidst the liveliness of towns, the tranquility of villages, and the resilient spirit echoing in every corner of my nation, it is easy to see that the most important tool for sculpturing a prosperous and secure future, the authentic heartbeat of innovation and the driving force behind every nation's progress is human capital. <laughs> Madam President, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Every leader dreams of a legacy. In my time as president of Ceredion, I have envisioned a legacy built on the foundation of human capital development. Such a focus is not merely a reflection of my personal experiences, though they are profound. Rising from humble beginnings, thanks to the determination of my mother, a peasant farmer of blessed memory, who was not formally educated, but instilled in me the transformative power of education. This morning, I went to her graveside because I knew I was coming to AU just to say thank you, mommy, you did not go to school, but you made me go to school, and I am the leader that you made, but you never enjoyed the fruit of your hard work. I am a testimony, and I can say that I've seen how the power of education unchains minds and unleashes potential. And I'm president distinguished, ladies and gentlemen, Suffice it to say that I was as persuaded in 1997 when I entered this university as I am today that human capital development is the most important asthma for building a prosperous and secure future and finding relevance in the 21st century. This has been the paradigm shift of our national development agenda, and is already manifesting transformative dividends. My lecture today, ladies and gentlemen, is anchored on the strength of an empowered mind built on human capital development, the responsibilities that come with it, and the extraordinary possibilities that lie ahead. 
We live in an era of rapid changes, innovations, and interconnectedness. Our inherited world vastly differs from one our parents and grandparents knew and left for us. Technological advancements have reshaped how we communicate, work, and live. But with these changes come both challenges and opportunities. My government understands the dynamics of today's prevailing world and has chosen to embrace its opportunities. For this reason, I made human capital plan of my government in my first five years as president. Sierra Leone is a nation with a tumultuous past. But we have moved beyond our history and made remarkable strides towards peace and stability thanks to our commitment to human capital development. Human capital development encompasses various initiatives to enhance individuals, skills, knowledge, and well-being, promoting socioeconomic progress, and ensuring long-lasting peace and security. My government's priority focus on human capital development is hinged on education, gender equality, youth empowerment, which I will briefly highlight here. In our collective pursuit of knowledge and development, we have also confront, we must also confront and navigate the unpredictabilities of leadership and life. Who could have foreseen when I when my government first came into power in 2018, that a global pandemic would greatly affect supply chains, economic stability, and food supply, or that a war in Europe could immensely cause turbulence beyond the borders. Despite this, we set out to beat the odds stacked against us by remaining undeterred in building a resilient economy through the New Direction National Development Agenda. <laughs> From the beginning, we emphasized the urgency of implementing wide-sweeping changes to put the economy on a new positive trajectory, implementing various essential policy interventions. We have made numerous bold and new investments and rolled out strategic national development programs, mostly connecting these priorities with human capital development agenda. Education. I agree with Bill Gates when he says, and I quote, your leading indicator of where you are going to be in 20 years from now is how is how well you are doing in your education system. End of quote. Elevating the stature of our nation's human capital through education has been of utmost importance. Our free quality education program emerged as the flagship initiative during my administration's inaugural five years tenure. We have consistently directed substantial investments towards our dynamic youth, recognizing that the true value of our nation is found in harnessing our human potential. Our commitment to education has remained unwavering despite the economic challenges presented since 2020. This dedication is evident as our education budget increased from below 15% in 2018 to 22% in subsequent years, supporting primary, secondary, higher technical and vocational education sectors. Our free quality education program has created great access, quality and equity for about 2 million children by removing financial barriers to school enrollment and 
improving teaching and learning outcomes. Our pioneering approach to radical inclusion in education, leaving no one behind, be it expectant girls, adult learners, children from our most vulnerable communities, or those with disabilities, has garnered commendations from the international community. Sierra Leone's transformative education policy has been celebrated globally, affirming our role as stewards advocates of education advancement. This global recognition culminated in my unanimous appointment as co-chair of UNESCO High Level Steering Committee dedicated to realizing UN Sustainable Goal 4, a commitment to ensuring inclusive, equitable, quality education and fostering lifelong learning for all. As an ardent supporter of universal education access, I was privileged to co-chair the Global Transforming Education Summit alongside the United Nations Security General, Antonius Guterres, in 2022. Additionally, the Global Partnership for Education honored me as one of the global champions for foundational learning for our 2022-2026 Partnership Compact. In a relatively brief period, my government must had substantial backing from our partners, prudently augmenting our domestic educational resources. These efforts have attracted over $200 million in support for our education sector since 2018. Under my administration, we have supported more than 80% of our schools through government subsidies, enlisted approximately 12,000 new educators and facilitated training for twice that number. We have welcomed also 800,000 new students and our strategic investments have notably enhanced learning results in Sierra Leone. Gender equality and women's empowerment. My government particularly takes girls' education seriously. As we know that countries become stronger and more prosperous when girls are educated. So investing in girls' education is a smart long-term investment for our nation. We have worked to achieve gender parity in our schools. Girls have higher retention and pass rates in all national transition exams. More girls are now studying STEM disciplines today they have higher transition rates into tertiary and vocational institutions. In line with our long, in line with our long-term vision to train more women engineers, doctors, scientists, and innovators, we have also implemented a policy that funds free education from primary school through university for all girls studying STEM disciplines. As Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie says, culture does not make people. People make culture. The culture we are consciously creating in Sierra Leone as one where education vastly improves the conditions for girls and women. Since 2018, we have witnessed a 37% increase in girls in school. Teenage pregnancy dropped by 33%, thanks be to the effort of the Ministry of uh, Health and Sanitation then, and Madam First Lady, who is sitting here. <laughs> a 
early marriage figures have also dropped dramatically. Sierra Leone has the highest rate of girls completing primary education in the entire West African sub-region. Madam President, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, true human capital development cannot be achieved if any segment of society remains overshadowed. In the poignant words of the luminary writer Arundi Roy, there is really no such thing as the voiceless. There are only the deliberately silenced, or the preferably unheard. One of my most cherished moments as Sierra Leone's president remains signing the progressive gender equality and women's <laughs> empowerment law. The Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment Law, or Bill into Law, ensuring women receive equal pay for equal work and amplifying their voices in all societal domains, from the workplace to the political arena. A minimum 30% representation of women is guaranteed by law. In our unwavering commitment to dismantle the barriers of gender inequality, I declared a state of emergency on the heinous crime of rape and sexual and gender-based violence in Sierra Leone. Through robust measures, we are championing justice, especially for the marginalized and the underprivileged, by the amendment of the Sexual Offenses Act, broadening the spectrum of legal aid and instituting a specialized court to expedite the adjudication of sexual offenses. In September 2021, at the United Nations, Sierra Leone with the Federal Republic of Nigeria su successfully moved a United Nations resolution titled International Cooperation for Access to Justice, Remedies and Assistance for the Survivors of Sexual Violence. A whole, a historic resolution for the survivors of sexual violence. It condemned in all forms of sexual it condemned all forms of sexual and gender-based violence and outlined a series of measures for member states to take effective action in line with international law. Youth and empowerment. Madam President, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, empowering our youth means giving them a voice in the decision-making process of our nation. This is why my government has marched towards with action by constituting one of the youngest cabinets in the history of our country. <laughs> 10 of my ministers are under the age of 40. <laughs> Over the last five years, beyond human capital in imperatives, my government has invested in young people by creating opportunities for training, entrepreneurship, and job creation. The Youth Empowerment Scheme for my second term mandate, promise, mandate promises that, young, that the young generation that have the energy, passion, and ambition will find fighter ground in Sierra Leone. We also intend to leverage the cutting-edge the, the cutting technology and infrastructure program to pave sustainable pathways for economic growth. My government has continued to rely 
on our young people to move from passive, being passive observers of the country's problem to being to partake in the actions that can move it forward. Our human capital development agenda equips young people with the knowledge and skills to be informed and to be critical thinkers, and they must use that knowledge for the greater good. I firmly believe that the best use of our lives is when it is lived for God and for country. Any life outside this principle is not worth living. It is also important to remember that, is, that success is not measured by solely, solely by personal achievements, but by positive impact on others and the world around us. I have just started my second term. Ladies and gentlemen, the last five years have come with a share of challenges, as we all know. But in the true nature of Sierra Leone spirit, we will never shut in the face of adversity. Challenges are an inevitable part of life and often the catalyst for the most significant change. Leadership exists to solve problems. We must remember that progress is not linear. And setbacks are opportunities to learn, adapt, and grow stronger. As I embark on my second term, I reaffirm my unwavering commitment to the five quintessential pillars that will shape our journey forward, namely achieving food security. Achieving food security is intimately linked with aggressive investment in agriculture. Our vision extends beyond merely feeding our people. We aim to ignite job creation, catalyze economic momentum, and significantly diminish the burdens of poverty. Human capital development is the second. We will continue investing in human capital development strategically to solve contemporary challenges and leverage opportunities with an unwavering emphasis on achieving gender parity in all domains. <laughs> youth, youth Employment Scheme is our solemn pledge to the vibrant youth of Sierra Leone that their dynamism, enthusiasm, and aspiration will be met with unparalleled Opportunity, with unparalleled opportunities in their homeland. Technology and infrastructure. It's a forward-looking initiative designed to lay the bedrock for resilient and sustainable avenues of economic progress. The reformation of our public service architecture is a meticulous overhaul aimed at enhancing efficiency instilling professionalism and ensuring a service delivery mechanism befitting the aspirations of our people. Let me conclude. Today, I stand before you not just as a representative of my country, but as a witness to the ebb and flow of global currents. These are indeed tough times for our world. The strongest economic quivers and continents like Africa stand at pivotal junctures. We witness shifts in power, erosion of democratic institutions, especially in our sub-region West Africa, and intensification of conflicts on a scale we hadn't imagined, and climate changes looming effects. Leadership must evolve in this era, marked by crises at every turn. 
We can no longer stand idly by as young workforce leaves our shores searching for greener pastures. We cannot ignore the displacement of our people due to strife or the stifling of our children's futures. It is not enough to be defenders of the status quo. We must become the disruptors. Disruptors who strive to lift communities out of the depth of poverty, enabling our youth to rise to global challenges and ensure that every individual has the freedom to dream, choose, and lead a fulfilling life. Every single one of us has a part to play. Leadership, I must say, is not a title. It is an action. I recall my times here in the United States and in this institution, a period of growth and learning. But the serene call of home was always present in my ears. I beckoned that guy, a beckon that guided my intention and actions. I had to return. I had to leave the United States to return home. Now, as I stand here, I feel like I have come full circle, nostalgic. Yes, that's why I have my AU cap on today. <laughs> and I have my School of International Service t-shirt at home. <laughs> Words can hardly capture this feeling. Our world is a mosaic of cultures, beliefs, and aspirations. It is up to us, especially those at the helm of our fears, to decide the legacy we wish to leave behind. Do we envisage a world of unity, justice, peace, and dignity? Or do we resign ourselves to divisions, disparities, and disenchantments? The intricate web of our global community means that the ripple effects of instability cannot be contained within borders anymore. Unity is not just a moral duty. It is a strategic imperative. As you chart your path, Disrupting and innovating, I urge you to always prioritize relationships and consensus. A world where different opinions coexist in vibrant, where the, co the, the coexistence of different opinions is vibrant and robust. Democracy thrives in these differences. The journey to addressing global issues is indeed long. And as the adage goes, if you want to go fast, the African adage goes, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. As we champion multilateralism on the global stage, it is paramount that we fiercely uphold political pluralism, freedom, and of freedom of expression and fundamental human rights within our bodies. As stewards of the future, let us all pledge to shine our collective line light into every shadow. Let us, let our voices rise in harmony, heralding the dawn of a brighter, limitless tomorrow. In closing, I want to leave you with a quote from President John F. Kennedy, who once said, and I quote, the future does not belong to those who are content with today. 
apathetic towards common problems and their fellow men alike, timid and fearful in the face of new ideas and bold projects, end of quote. I want to add, permit me, ladies and gentlemen, that the future belongs to those who create it. In Sierra Leone, we are building the future, a new breed of young people who are neither content, apathetic, nor timid. We are building change makers, our hope for a better tomorrow. I therefore invite all of you to join us and support us in our journey to building a prosperous middle-income country by 2035. Thank you all for listening. inspiring words, um, Your Excellency. <laughs> um, my name is Susan Shepler, and I'm a professor here at the School of International Service. But I want to make me salon people that know say, me na salon bossy. So I'm, I'm here as a stakeholder in Sierra Leone's development as well. <laughs> um, and I want to start by also recognizing how very kind you've been to us, me, and SIS students when we have traveled to Sierra Leone. A few years ago, you welcomed us right into your office in State House, uh, a set of uh, SIS master students, and shared time with us and your thoughts about the importance of education. And I just think that's so amazing that we have that kind of access to the president of the country. So thank you very much. You. On behalf of the students. So the way we've um, structured this is that I have a number of questions that I'll be asking. Um, but we also, if time permits, want to answer your questions as well. So you've seen that there are cards available for you to write down questions. If you have questions, um, please write them down and pass them along. We do have a team here that will be looking through them to make sure we're not asking questions that I've already asked, um, and that we, because we have very little time, that we have time for as many questions as possible. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll go with the questions that I've already um, submitted. You have such an interesting personal story in terms of changes in your trajectory. Um, and you've already spoken a little bit about how AU was such a big part of your personal trajectory. I wonder if you can tell us about other institutions um, that you've been a part of. I know you went to Bow School, for example. Um, the military, um, the Catholic Church. Um, how have other institutions really impacted you as a person and as a leader? Normally, we don't recognize the fact that we are captives of our culture. I've had to go through different institutions, starting with my home. My mom was a widow at a very early age, a peasant farmer who was not fortunate to have gone to school at all, not. And um, being able to get to this point in life means she laid the primary foundation upon which this great man is built. So my schooling at Bo School, which was a school dedicated for leadership in Suradium by the British colonial masters, and then entering the, the military, as an officer cadet means you are being trained to become a leader. And um, when I left the board school, I went into the military. Of course, I served 
at the war front. I was in Liberia at the height of the war, and I came back to Sierra Leone. I led at the war front and also led the war as part of the military government that came after. I was patriotic enough to let go power for the sake of Sierra Leone. And the very hard I hastily prepared the American election. I also initiated the peace process and got Sanko out of the bush. And we had a first ceasefire. And it was during that time that I left the country. After that, I left the country. When I left, I came to the Great America and to the American University and to the School of International Service. Um, I was a different kind of student because for most of the students, uh, we, we, we had, they had to do theory and they were expected to go out into the world and get the practical. <laughs> I had done my practical <laughs> and I came for the theoretical jacket. <laughs> And you gave me a very beautiful jacket, <laughs> School of International Service. You trained me to be a global nomad, and I've been one ever since I've left. I've heard the flag high, and I always remind people that of all the institutions, all of them have played critical roles, but you, this university, played a pivotal role because at the American University, you have access to all sorts of lecturers from Pentagon to State Department to everybody. That's the beauty here. And students too. So for me, that was a great opportunity. And I think I acquired quite a lot of knowledge and values that have been at the forefront of my leadership. Thank you. Um, it's pretty exciting. I don't know if people know, but Sierra Leone is going to have a seat on the UN Security Council this year. Can you talk a bit about what it means for Sierra Leone to have this new prominence in international affairs? And how do you and your government plan to make use of this influence? A prominence in international affairs. That was why I came to the School of International Affairs. <laughs> so that when I leave my country, I will take it to prominence in international affairs. The craft I learned from here is what I've taken over there. We are a country renowned for corruption, for all the ease of society. The stigma of the past was a drag on us. And what I did was to try to clean up the image first. Yes, sir. For corruption, the corruption index that we inherited was so bad that we are considered one of the most corrupt countries in the world. I've changed that. We have moved nearly 20 paces up in just five years. <laughs> the Transparency International valuation and also the MCC which is an American institution we have passed the score of, uh, uh, of uh, corruption index for the past five years the previous government before me for 11 years failed woefully and since I took over we have passed the index for five complete years, going as far as 83%, the highest they got in, the highest they ever got in, in 11 years was 49. I have passed consistently and we have gone as far as 83%. So what I did was to clean the image so that we can again regain our space among the committee of nations, will be respected we had to do everything to 
It's a very crowded place, as you know. The internationals uh, <laughs> and there, there are a lot of other countries that want to be at the at the UN Security Council, be it in the permanent or the non-permanent category. So we had to do quite a lot to be considered worthy of that position. That is what we did. And for me, it is important because we have um, been able to secure peace with the support of the international community. It is now time for us to take peace to other parts of the world, to share our experience as a country that was ravaged by war and the, how we were able, through a peaceful settlement, to get peace. I think it's an opportunity. Of course, I have to ask you about the most recent election. Um, various observers, including the Carter Center, have raised concerns about the fairness of the election, especially focused on the work of the Electoral Commission, ECSL. Um, the U.S. State Department has issued visa restrictions on Sierra Leoneans involved in what they call election interference. And we'd all like to hear your reactions to those allegations and to the actions taken in response. Uh, elections are always contentious issues wherever they happen in the world, including in the United States. <laughs> but I do not have the power to issue visa restrictions, of course. <laughs> That's the difference. Please allow me to continue coming to Sierra Leone. <laughs> Elections are conducted by a body mandated by our constitution and its operational mode is directed by the um, Public Elections Act. Normally, before elections take place, because we have our partners, including the United States, the EU, the British, and other organizations that are interested in democracy, a steering committee is put together and all stakeholders, including political parties, are represent, represented in that, stake, in that steering committee. What they do is to look at everything that has to be done, the rules of the game, to make sure that the Public Elections Act is clean and will lead to a credible election at the end of the day. That was what pertained in Syria. I was not a member of that. The only thing we did for the election was to make sure that whatever the, the national electoral body asked for, we provided, including funds and security. Their business, they are an independent, semi-autonomous body in the sense that we don't with their um, daily day-to-day -day operations. We don't control that at all. If we do, that would be interference. That's ECSL? ECSL. And they did that. When the elections were all well, at, the, at the height of calling the result, this was when the problem started. Uh, they had done all their calculations, collation, and all the, 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 the processes. I was now requested to stop them from calling the, the result by the United States. So I don't know who is ac accusing who of interference. Yes. <laughs> And I declined. I declined and I said, I, we, I have never called this institution. I am not going to call them now. If there are any issues, let's deal with them. Let's leave them to finish. This is very critical. Let's also take into consideration the, the context in West Africa, a very volatile region. We are threatened by jihadists in the whole of the Sahel, from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea. We have military governments. A few of, of us are surviving as democratically elected governments. And 
when the United States cast doubt on an election that was considered to be the most peaceful, not my words, but the observers, uh, free and fair, and then the United States cast doubt on the credibility, you are calling for a coup. This is what we don't recognize. In any case, the same representatives of the United States have told us that in any case, they just wanted the second round. In any case, I was going to win because all the polls made that clear. And I can say here that based on what I have done in the last five years, under the circumstances, we can go to the polls today and on that, in, in a free, fair election, I will not get 56%. I will get nothing less than 60%. So, I mean, uh, it is unfortunate what the U U.S. has done. In so far, we have a great bilateral relationship with the United States. I told the American ambassador in my office, I said, I am a better ambassador for America in Sierra Leone than you are. <laughs> I was trained in, in the United States, and I know the values that should be projected out there. You are a stranger, you've only been here for a few days. I will allow you to go, but know that I'm a better ambassador here for the United States than you. So it's unfortunate what is happening, uh, casting doubt and creating that uh, um, 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 uh, uh, air of instability. But we still seek a great relationship. We are looking for a reconsideration. Well, this is my next question, actually. I saw that you met with the new U.S. ambassador, who himself is an American University alum. Oh. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> yes, I, I heard about that. Uh, Brian David Hunt is his name. Um, and you said on Twitter, my government remains committed to working with the United States towards strengthening our strategic partnership and mutually beneficial cooperation. So, so given the U.S. sanctions related to the election, how do you see the future of U.S. Sierra Leone cooperation? Are you looking to work with other partners internationally? Um, of course, uh, we have a great relationship. I think this is just a little pack. And it will prepare of when the objective reality is, is understood by the United States. Sometimes the wrong information filters out here, and those actions are informed by the wrong information. I still believe that I will use my time in the United States and also try to contact different people to understand. We are only 60 years into democracy. We are not 250 years. <laughs> we should be allowed to make mistakes. If we do, correct the mistake and we will continue. <laughs> we, should be, we should not be treated as if we are the experts in democracy, elections are always troublesome, and we should be careful how we deal with them. So um, we, we are seeking a, a very uh, amicable relationship. We will continue to explain. We know somebody somewhere is going to hear the truth and know that um, sometimes dialogue is better than these coercive punitive actions. So moving away from that now, <laughs> um, you mentioned yourself that you've appointed a lot of young new cabinet ministers, including a large number of young women and men. I want to ask you about, in particular, about your new chief minister, who's sitting right here, uh, David Senge. <laughs> he, as many of you know, he got a PhD at MIT, went to Harvard, and has worked his way up in your government 
from Chief Innovation Officer to Minister of Education, and now Chief Minister. Um, many of us attended his recent book launch events in DC uh, at Politics and Prose, <laughs> where he talked about how he was able to convince you of his concept of radical inclusion, and that you now are also a proponent of radical inclusion. Um, I guess my question is, can you tell us what you see in this man? <laughs> and why you have promoted him so rapidly? Wow. Yeah. Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think uh, in my, in my uh, when I was talking, I did talk about disruptors. Mm -hmm. I think I'm looking for disruptors. The um, the old ways of think, doing things have not worked for us. We must accelerate our, our our pace, and we need people who can disrupt the status quo to get to the top. Mm -hmm. So. When you have young men who are informed, educated, enlightened, all they need is the necessary exposure and guidance, and they can do great things. Our population is about 60-70% young. We, I'm reflecting that in my cabinet. That's democracy. The women are 51%. We are inching towards that by giving them a floor of nothing less than 30% in all uh, domains of human endeavor. We are actually talking the talk and walking the walk as far as democracy is concerned. If we are going to cater for the young people, they should be here. They should be where we make the decisions. Yes, they have to be there. They bring new perspectives, as you know. Uh, so are women from another planet. <laughs> With 51% of them, if you don't bring them into your mix and you make laws and you make uh, decisions, you are leaving a huge chunk of valuable information out and perspective. This is why we are building democracy from the bottom top. So he, he may be one, but there are so many of them. The other young man sitting there, the women all over there, the other women at the back, women at the back there is a member of parliament, you know. Uh, this young man sitting here is the foreign minister. I, <laughs> I also have. Oh, and we have another AU alone in your cabinet. Yes. Right? Uh, he he was hiding from me until I told him myself. He said he went to the school of public affairs. I said, never knew this. You know, so um, what we have done is, I think it's a beautiful mix. We have very strong. Uh, um, um, uh, people that are older with a lot of knowledge, experience, and they are dotted in among them and they infuse experience. And that is what is helping them. And I am also, remember, I told you I led the peace process that brought peace to Ceredion. I initiated that one. I brought democracy to Ceredion when I was in my 20s, late 20s, after nearly um, 30 years of one party rule, if I could do that in my 20s, they can do that in their 30s. We're educated, I'm more exposed than I was at the time I made those uh, strategic decisions for our country. So I believe and trust in that. <laughs> my question, and then we'll turn to the others. Okay. Um, I know we have members of the Sierra Leone diaspora here today, um, and I'm sure you'd like an opportunity to address the diaspora about how they can best be involved in Sierra Leone's development. Well, um, quite a lot of them are involved already. Most of, some of the people, uh, some of them, we, the, the ones at home, you know that they call their home base, 
and we call this one the village is power. <laughs> so we combine them because there's so much. I have always said to people, we come to places in the West to learn the good things that you've done to make your, your society stick and function. It is our responsibility to take those values and systems back home. So there is quite a lot of exposure, uh, the value systems they've acquired, uh, work ethic, and every other thing. So we take from time to time, we pick among them, and we also combine that with the home, and we get going. <laughs> so I believe that they have a role to play. Um, um, the different expertise. We still have huge capacity gaps, I must confess. The only thing is that um, we cannot uh, pay them enough when they, go, when they go back home. So it's always difficult to convince them to go back home. Those who have gone have made serious sacrifices as far as remuneration is concerned. So, um, Sierra Leone is in the diaspora, you are always invited back. Just have to be ready to make this necessary <coughs> sacrifice. You cannot get up at one and think that you can go to McDonald's and get your... <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you touch the first set and it's just... <laughs> no water. <laughs> And uh, so, uh, there are inconveniences to suffer, yeah. but that is part of the patriotism. We have to work, we have to fix. I see here for us, we come and learn and go and fix. Yeah. All right, I have some questions on the cards from the audience now. Um, the first one is one I'm very interested in, so I'm starting with it. Uh, is the government committed to educating youth about the Civil War? And if so, what steps are being taken? The Civil War is, a, the war is an important part of our history. In fact, we should keep um, reminding them what led to the war and how that war ravaged our country and how it set us back as far as development is concerned, and to strive to never again go back to that as the Americans do. So it has to be, it is, it, it, it is an important part of our history, and we should, our children should know that we've had a very difficult past, and we should never go back to the past. We should always dialogue, dialogue. Democracy is the way to go, you know? The majority will always determine who rules the country. And when we have challenges, we should use the, um, all local remedies through dialogue. I see you also recently appointed um, Joseph Alfalo as head of um, monuments. monuments. Yeah, yeah. yeah Joseph. What do you think about a monument of some kind? I'm going off A monument to, um, to the war. When you asked this question, I thought about him, but I just didn't want to go. De definitely. <clears throat> um, uh, definitely, we have to make every effort, not only to document what happened, but also have um, uh, a place that we remind our people. And we are, we are working towards that. Um, if there's any help that you have identified, it's welcome. Thank you. Okay, another question from the audience. What do you think was your biggest success when dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic? What strategies helped the most? Uh, our COVID strategy was informed by our um, Ebola experience. We had a rough time as a nation dealing with um, 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 uh, Ebola. I was not at the helm at the time, I was in opposition, but I was fully involved. I went around the country during Ebola to look at the structures. We had international support, but we still lost over 3,000 people. Once, and Ebola 
was even more infectious and deadly than uh, uh, COVID. So we had already developed a system right across the country that involved quite a lot of uh, people from the traditional leaders to community leaders, to the military, to the police, the, 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 the healthcare system, and many, everybody was involved. So once I realized the, the, the epidemiology of this particular uh, COVID, we decided to stand up all the agencies we had used to fight uh, Ebola. So before our index case, we had closed the, 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 the international border. So at the end, uh, you were there. <laughs> so um, we, I think, uh, we fell back from our experience with COVID, uh, Ebola, and um, we already had vestiges, or already a lot of people in the system knew how to deal with this sort of thing. That is another thing. So besides government effort, we needed, we reminded people of the need to to take the necessary precautionary measures that we were, you know. Um, and um, we did not close down, lock down at any one point in time, except for two, I think for two, two or three days. Um, we, because I, we custom made our own response to, 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 to COVID. When uh, other nations we are locking down for weeks and two weeks and a month, we never once closed for even more than three days because we knew what to do. We had had the experience and we, that, that experience informed our every action. We stood up the whole scientific community of, again, the diaspora. In fact, most of them were in the diaspora. Uh, who, who knew, uh, including, and I remember, the, the, our president, Minister of, uh, of Health, he was still here, but he was part of our uh, scientific community informing our activities back there and a few others around the world and uh, also back home. So the, the, the diaspora has always been an integral part of what we do and that was one great example uh, uh, of how we reacted to COVID. We, uh, in, in COVID, we lost uh, less than 200 people. In Ebola, we lost over 3,000 people. So um, I think uh, the experience, a bitter experience, was uh, was at the fore in our decision making. The next question starts off. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Um, what do you envision for Sierra Leone in 20 years' time? What will be different? What will be the same? <coughs> it's a very tricky question. Um, but. <laughs> I, I, I think, um, for me, uh, you, you know quite a lot about Sierra Leone, and there's always uh, the tendency for Sierra Leoneans to talk about the wealth that we have. And normally they're talking about the potential. We get diamond, we get all And um, what I have said to them, let's have all of this. I said to them, more precious than gold, diamond, and all the things that we have is a human resource that we have. And we should invest in the human resource of our country. And that is what we are doing. I strongly believe that the investments, the quality of investment, and even the anecdotal evidence coming from what has happened over the past five years, I'm very, very uh, um, optimistic that Sweden in 20 years, we start to regain its uh, place as the Athens of West Africa, what is normally known as a leading nation. Yes, because our prowess as a nation at the time was actually our intellectual capacity. We were the ones uh, creating knowledge and sharing in the whole of West Africa and beyond. And we can do that. And that is what we have started. So it's a great revolution in the way. And when you consider that, and also the, the fifth salon, which is food security and economic stability, then Syria will be a totally different place. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
but in 20 years, a living income country. That is what I aspire to. What do you think will be the same in 20 years? I don't think that with anything will be the same. Yeah. Yes, because um, I mean, the human being is at the center of everything that we do. As part of our uh, of our uh, uh, progress, we are actually changing the mindset, which is the most difficult, yeah. the mindset of our people to know that we don't need aid. We can create our own aid. We can solve our problems. And now students are beginning to get off their, their couches, going to fend for themselves. We have the brain power. So once we can do that, the human being changes. Every other thing around us is going to change. The physical environment is going to change. The, the, our, our, the, very, the very thing that holds us as captives, our culture, maybe even that one will not be the same because we would have taken in quite a lot of other uh, uh, great aspects of other cultures and that will definitely positively impact our own culture. We'll still be eating cassava leaves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <right. laughs> I can see. <laughs> We'll be cooking it differently. What is your administration doing to ensure free speech while keeping the peace and stability of Sierra Leone? Free speech. Nobody is in prison for free speech. For writing an article. In fact, the oldest restriction on free speech was a seditious libel law, which we have changed. <laughs> so free speech, I, I know that for five years, there's no uh, um, um, uh, pressman in prison. Um, they normally say that I have the thickest political skin because I don't respond to the frivolities. If you write objective things that are constructive, I will call you and engage you. Tell me more. Because I don't know everything. I don't have monopoly over ideas. If you engage constructively, the worst punishment is come and talk to me. Tell me more. And be a part of governance. But to say that free speech, there's nothing about wrong with free speech in Sierra Leone. There's no evidence uh, contrary to uh, I mean, the views that nobody has been, has been has been molested, arrested, or what. In fact, what the, about protests and the form of speech? Protest. Protest is part of democracy, and we are a democratic country. You know, protest also has. Everything done in the democracy is done within the confines of laws. Um, I know a lot of people talk about, let's not shy away from it, the 10th of August last year. That was not a protest. Ten. I mean, there is hardship, there is economic hardship everywhere. If you came out with a placard, and you're saying that there is inflation, you're only saying what I know. <coughs> I will agree with you even more. That I know. We are doing, today I was with the IMF, we are doing everything possible. But are we alone in that? No. Today, or yesterday, even in the United States, there is augmentation of prices. There is inflation everywhere. So, when protesters come out and six policemen are dead, are those protesters? No, they are terrorists. Six policemen are dead immediately. Do those policemen have a right, a human right? 
Yes, they do. They have children. Or they were there to keep the peace. They did not shoot. They were not, not armed, that's why they died. You see, so um, when we talk about protests, protest is part of democracy and is accepted. So we would expect that when you come out to protest, you follow the rules and you'll be, you'll be okay. I normally extend invitations and I always tell people that we are going to fix our own country and um, we encourage them to go back home uh, for holidays and most of them who go back normally fall in love with their own country and uh, with, the, with, 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 with uh, the right opportunities that we lash onto those. I think we have to provide those opportunities for them so that somebody, because um, if a young man or a young woman can find employment back there and be able to pay his or her rent and other uh, responsibilities, they are, they are very much likely to stay. Um, what we have not been able to do, especially in terms of the, uh, the amount you know, required for them to stay afloat, especially most times they would have gotten a mortgage or other responsibilities here. You cannot walk there and be able to take care of your mortgage here. So that is a great decision to uh, the young people is that home is home and home can be only fixed by us. We have to go back home at one time or the other. A great experience to be here, to learn and to live. But I think it is worthy a cause to go back home and help because there are millions there who need our help. Most of us who can read and write are, should be ambassadors. That is how I've always seen myself. I can go to my village and if you look at them, all of them are illiterate. Those people need help. Those people need our support. Otherwise, they will never fulfill their potential in this world. And we who can do that have, should endeavor, make the sacrifice to go back home. We can, I mean, when I finished 20 years ago um, in Virginia, I could have stayed, you know, like many others, but I made the deliberate choice. I said, home is where I can make the greatest um, 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 contribution. So I have to go back home. That is what they, they are going to have to. But if you just look at the remuneration, the facilities and everything that, that is there, you will never go back home. Never. It's a sacrifice. Well, you know, salon sweet. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much again for thank taking you. the time to join us today, and thanks to everyone for being here.